Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the dinner banquet of the 2023 Yushan Forum. It's been a long day, and we are grateful for the views and insights shared in the forum. And now it's time for us to sit back, relax, and enjoy each other's company. First of all, we're going to welcome the host of the banquet, Dr. Zhao Xie Joseph Wu, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Republic of China, Taiwan, to give us his remarks. Please put your hands together to welcome Minister Wu. Please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have a very simple word tonight, is to introduce our keynote speaker. The Honorable Scott Morrison, Member of Parliament and former Prime Minister of Australia. Distinguished guests from around the world. Uh, and we also have a Secretary General of our National Security Council, Wellington Gu, and also the Minister of Economic Affairs, uh, Madam Wang. And for your information, they are very good couples in Taiwan politics, probably the most powerful one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm very pleased and honored to host this Yushan Forum dinner banquet in honor of our special guest and the keynote speaker, the Honorable Scott Morrison, Member of Parliament and former Prime Minister of Australia. The theme of this year's USAM Forum is Start a New Blueprint for Asian Development. I'm sure you will agree with me that Mr. Morrison is an ideal speaker to share his perspective. He has been a member of the Australian Parliament since 2007 and served as Prime Minister and leader of the Liberal Party in 2018 to 2022. Both his status and achievements are admirable. Even though we have several former Australian Prime Ministers visited Taiwan previously, this is the first time we have a former PM come to Taiwan so soon after he can travel here without diplomatic constraints. And for this, we are very grateful. And this, is also, this also gives him a very unique position to address the regional, even global dynamics and provide his insights with fresh memories. During his tenure as Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison and his government have advocated for peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific, including in the Taiwan Strait. He and his government saw the geopolitical uncertainty and tension and took steps to strengthen the cooperation with key like-minded partners. The geopolitical dynamics today is marked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the PRC expansionism in the Indo-Pacific. The PRC in particular is for fellow democracies to worry about. It is hard authoritarian power that has both motivation and capability to rewrite the rules-based international order. It has been threatening peace and stability and changing the status quo in the East and South China Seas and the Taiwan Strait. It is also motivated to expand its power and influence in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, and even into Africa and the Western Hemisphere. I must say that Australia has not been sitting idly in facing all these challenges posed by authoritarian expansionism. It came into embracing the Quad Security Dialogue, entered into AUKUS Military Pact, and signed a reciprocal access agreement with Japan. These actions have demonstrated Australian government's de determination to be one of the most critical players in the entire region to safeguard a free and open, stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific. All these significant transformations have taken place under Mr. Morrison's supervision and were implemented by his very able cabinet. On the Taiwan-Australia ties, we have been important partners in the Indo-Pacific region. We share the fundamental values of freedom, democracy, protection of human rights, and the rule of law. We both also believe in the rules-based international order. We continue to enhance people-to-people, 
cultural, educational, and economic ties. Now, Taiwan is Australia's fifth largest trading partner and the fourth largest export market. Meanwhile, Australia is Taiwan's seventh largest trading partner. Moreover, we both responded quickly to the Russian invasion of Ukraine by condemning and sanctioning Russia. We both came to support Ukraine. And in short, we are good partners doing good things for each other and for the rest of the world. I, as an admirer of Australia, assure you that this direction will not change from Taiwan's perspective. We will always take Australia as a good friend and a good partner. Now, Mr. Morrison, a great friend of Taiwan and a highly accomplished international leader, is ready to share his insights with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to Mr. Morrison. Well, thank you very much, Joseph. Minister Wu, I appreciate that very kind introduction that was so generous. I feel like I should just sit down immediately. <laughs> it's hard to uh, expand on that, but I certainly will. Can I also recognise Her Excellency the Ambassador and the many other guests who are here this evening, other ministers, uh, colleagues from around the world, um, particularly all of those who are here in, in one purpose, and that is we are friends of Taiwan. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here and, and take part in this very important forum. I'm pleased to be able to join you this evening um, because it is a privilege to have been invited. And I'm especially pleased to have been able to join uh, the Taiwanese people for your National Day celebrations yesterday. Uh, Taiwan has much to be proud of and much to celebrate. And it was nice to be able to do that with you yesterday. Uh, Taiwan is like almost no other place on the planet. No place could be more central to the cause of liberty and democracy at this time than Taiwan, including even Ukraine, where war continues to range, as the ambassador reminded us and spoke passionately about today. Taiwan is a unique case, and we must be careful in drawing parallels between potential conflicts in Taiwan and elsewhere, especially regarding their global implications, because I believe Taiwan stands, frankly, above them all in a geopolitical context. To put them in the same context um, would be problematic. When my government took the decision for Australia to swiftly provide lethal aid to support and assist Ukraine following the illegal invasion by Russia, that decision was taken with as much of having Beijing in mind as Moscow. We did it, certainly, to support Ukraine in their time of need and to defend democracy there. But we also did it to demonstrate our alignment with a global Western resolve to resist the aggression of authoritarianism, especially given the tacit endorsement of that invasion by Beijing, which continues to this day despite their denials. As I said, I was as concerned about Beijing as I was about Moscow. The PRC's claims over Taiwan are a threat to the entire region, as they are not isolated to Taiwan. There are also similar claims in the South China Sea, the Senkaku Islands, the Tano Island, and so on. Legitimately, in the region, one can ask, if Taiwan, then what and who is next? The threat is not just true for those of us who live here in the Indo-Pacific, like Australia, but globally. At the very least, there is a consensus that conflict in Taiwan would cause a severe and lasting global economic depression. Strategically, though, if the PRC were to forcefully occupy Taiwan, this would enable the PRC to project well beyond the first island chain, which would radically alter the security environment within the Indo-Pacific, through which the bulk of the world's trade passes. When combined with Russia's aggression in Ukraine, it would also significantly reset the balance of the international rules-based order in favour of autocracy and authoritarianism. There is therefore no country 
in the world that is too far away from Taiwan not to be impacted by Taiwan's future. The future of Taiwan is inextricably linked to all of our futures and the peace, security and freedom of the world we live in. It has now been some 50 years since Australia established diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. At that time, we adopted what is known as the One China Policy. Now, there is often confusion and differing interpretations of what this policy actually means. So let me be clear about what I think it means, what it is and what it isn't. In recognising the People's Republic of China in 1972, Australia's One China Policy acknowledged that the PRC had claims over Taiwan. However, it did not recognise the legitimacy of those claims either way, on behalf of any party. Taiwan's ultimate status was to be resolved peacefully. In the US, a similar stance was adopted and added to by Congress through the Taiwan Relations Act and then by the Reagan administration's six assurances, attaching the notion of strategic ambiguity regarding Taiwan's defence. Now, a lot has changed in these last 50 years. Taiwan has been transformed into a modern, free, and vibrant representative democracy with an advanced developed economy producing the world's most critical and sophisticated technology that powers our world. We could not have said that about Taiwan 50 years ago and probably 30 years ago and even maybe 20. It was a very different place from today and it is an incredible success story achieved under extraordinary duress. Now, across the Straits, the PRC has become the world's second largest economy, lifting more people out of poverty over that time than any other nation in history. Now, that is truly an extraordinary and highly commendable achievement. It is, I would say, the single greatest economic miracle in human history. Professor Yasheng Huang from MIT recently highlighted in Foreign Affairs the irony that this success was actually not achieved by adherence to the communist policies of statism, but orthodox market economics. He described Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms as utterly convention, opening China to the world, allowing greater entrepreneurship, reducing government price controls, and even privatising state-owned industries. Now, those types of reforms have more in common with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan than Mao Zedong and Karl Marx. But sadly, that's where the similarities between China and the West ended. Over those same years, and before, and later, and later, what we have seen over those same years is a communist regime in Beijing that has expanded and reinforced the apparatus of a highly authoritarian, autocratic, one-party state responsible for the repression and deaths of millions, from the Cultural Revolution to the Tiananmen Square Massacre and the most recent and ongoing oppression in Xinjiang. Under President Xi, these authoritarian controls have risen to new levels, with a rejuvenation of the PRC's cultural Marxist ambitions, harnessing new technologies to monitor and control their population and repudiating the economic reforms of the Deng area relegating economic freedoms to the same fate as the political and religious freedoms in the PRC. At the same time, the PRC has used its growing economic power to build its capacity to assert its ambition within the region and globally, militarily, diplomatically, economically. It's used grey zone tactics where necessary to coerce and intimidate. Under President Xi in particular, the PRC has made it very, very clear that they wish to rebalance the global rules-based order, establishing following the end of the Second World War in a way that better advantages their interests and autocracies like them, such as Russia, Iran and North Korea. This has been on show most recently when the PRC allowed their banking system to continue to support Russia as they wage their illegal war against Ukraine. Now, as Prime Minister of Australia, I experienced the PRC's coercive tactics firsthand, but I haven't been the only one. Of course, Taiwan knows all about this, but also South Korea, Japan, Lithuania, Norway, and many more who have all felt the frost of Beijing's displeasure when they haven't gone along with Beijing's script. Pleasingly, most, if not all, have stood their ground 
and Australia certainly did. Boosting our economic and strategic resilience by deepening our ties with key partners in the region, such as the United States, Japan, India, South Korea and ASEAN countries, through initiatives, as the Minister mentioned, such as AUKUS and the Quad Leaders Dialogue, the Reciprocal Access Defence Agreement with Japan, the first of its kind with Japan of any nation, and the first ever comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN, and numerous trade agreements. And I'll be forever grateful for the resolve of the Australian people in supporting our strong stand on these issues, especially those agricultural and resource producers who are targeted by Beijing's illegal trade sanctions. I welcome the fact that Australia and the PRC are now talking once again. Of course, talk is always important. However, I note Beijing has not walked away or backed up any of their stated grievances with Australia, which included our commitment to a freedom of speech, free press and the sovereign right to make and enforce laws about foreign investment, espionage, national security. Now, while their removal of some illegal trade sanctions is welcome, this is something that should be expected, not commended, and certainly not haggled for. To do so demeans the sacrifice Australians made to stand up for our own freedom and sovereignty. Now, most relevant to Taiwan, China's economic rise has been deliberately used to establish a capability to forcibly bring Taiwan under Beijing's control. This capability will soon be achieved, potentially within the next few years, and with a target date set by President Xi for 2027. Whether the PRC chooses to exercise this capability or not is entirely another matter. This is the subject of a more extensive calculus, which we must work constantly to ensure never adds up. This is achievable. As the Ukraine experience demonstrates, but I also must say in Iraq and Afghanistan, wars can be started, but they cannot be easily concluded, nor their purposes durably accomplished. The combination of the increasing assertiveness and authoritarianism of the communist regime in China, especially under President Xi, and the incessant threatening of Taiwan, combined with the success of Taiwan's democratisation and market-based economy, places great pressure on the One China policy settings in the West, which were established to protect a status quo. Now, from our perspective, from the West perspective, as I said this morning, this status quo is anchored in three things. Preventing conflict, ensuring respect for the autonomy of the people of Taiwan, and the maintenance of a strategic balance within the Indo-Pacific region that favours peace, stability and prosperity. Now, I would go further to say, in tribute to my dear and departed friend, the late Shinzo Abe, a strategic balance that favours a free and open Indo-Pacific. Any violation and or subjugation of Taiwan would obliterate this balance. This status quo is worth protecting and must be protected. Our challenge is how we now protect this balance in a vastly altered geopolitical environment to the one in which our One China policy settings were first established 50 years ago. Now, this requires a critical appraisal of our diplomatic, economic and security policy settings within the context of preserving that status quo regarding Taiwan. This appraisal should challenge the justice, perceived justice, of denying the people of Taiwan who have expressed a clear preference for freedom through the success of their representative democracy, greater certainty over their own autonomy and the opportunity to participate more fully in global and regional affairs, where they have much to offer. This means positively broadening the scope and nature of our unofficial relations with Taiwan, both bilaterally and multilaterally, in non-political, humanitarian, scientific and trade arenas, for example, within a modernised One China framework. Admission of Taiwan as a non-state into the CPTPP, Interpol, ICAO, the ICAO, the World Health Organization and other UN forums. Tick, 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 Minister, as you recently made the case for well in the Australian Financial Review. This would be a great start and it is long overdue. Other options include adjunct non-member engagement in economic, environmental, technological and humanitarian dialogues with multi lateral fora, particularly in our region, which could include the Quad. 
Under such one-China policy settings, Taiwan's political, sorry, practical autonomy could be enhanced, while at the same time not crossing the threshold of national statehood. We also need to be clear-eyed and insistent about our objectives. We should not lower the bar. Our one-China policy settings require competing claims over Taiwan's sovereignty to be resolved peacefully. No self-respecting representative democracy could ever credibly reconcile that objective with an outcome obtained by a resistance is futile approach that seeks to exhaust Taiwan's political will and or international diplomatic resolve and is fuelled by a manufactured spectre of inevitability. Such an approach needs to be called out. Such a coercive approach could never be considered peaceful. Peace is not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of freedom. Some claim the door should be left open to such an outcome in the name of self-determination for Taiwan. However, the notion that a free people of today's Taiwan would ever willingly put themselves under the rule of an authoritarian communist regime is simply not credible. The recent experience of the citizens of Hong Kong, whose liberties have been overrun, only confirm this point. Some will also argue that updating our understanding of the status quo regarding Taiwan and our one China policy settings risks provoking the PRC and injuring the fragile stability that has been achieved over the past 50 years, perhaps. But such criticism actually confesses to the PRC being an aggressor that needs to be appeased through one China policy settings rather than actively deterred. I'm in the deterrence camp. And for those who think deterrent is a provocation, this view indulges the fantasy that China plays by the same rules and shares a similar perspective. They do not. It was not active deterrence by the West that forced the PRC to turn island atolls into airports, to illegally harass their neighbours in the South China Sea and ignore the findings of the UNCLOS Tribunal on their territorial incursions. It was their nationalistic ambition. The passive response of the then Obama administration to PRC's incursions in the South China Sea regrettably only encouraged the PRC to go further. These airports are now effectively stationary aircraft carriers and military installations, which is completely contrary to the assurances given at the time of their construction by the PRC. The PRC's further attempts to now lock the rest of the world out of the South China Sea is a further example that the PRC will continue to push the boundaries until someone is prepared to say no. And I was pleased to lead a government that said no. Acts of aggression by the PRC towards Taiwan not, are not limited to physical conflict, but they include acts of intimidation and coercion that could credibly be argued to have already released the United States from their adherence to their One China policy under the US Taiwan Relations Act. The US and its allies, including Australia, though, have wisely kept these controls in place. A recent Council, of Foreign, Council on Foreign Relations Independent Task Force, Task Force report on the US Taiwan relations wisely recommended it is better to avoid symbolic and dipl diplomatic gestures that provoke a Chinese response. But here's the important bit. But do not meaningfully improve Taiwan's defensive capabilities, resilience, or economic competitiveness. And that is where our focus must be. The same report also concluded that abandoning a long, abandoning a long time partner and vibrant democracy of 23 million people located at a critical position in the world's most economically important region would be an act of strategic malpractice and moral bankruptcy. And I agree. The PRC's enhanced assertiveness and aggressive capability in the region has fundamentally changed the environment in which all of these issues now have to be understood. To deny this new reality or imagine it away in the vain hope we can all go back to how we thought things were, go were going to be different before President Xi this is fanciful and it's dangerous. It also wrongly assumes, as Pottinger and Canapathy argued in their dissenting report to the CFR Task Force report, that Beijing can and is seeking to be reassured. They are not. As always, they are testing resolve and likely responses to assist their assessment of the Straits calculus. The past 50 years, the West has opened up to China, providing the capital, technology, international market access, finance, diplomatic engagement, and political recognition that has enabled China's economic miracle. 
Most in the West believed that this would lead to a softening of the communist regime's authoritarian tendencies, reinforcement of the rules-based international order, and greater freedoms for the people of the PRC. These were noble objectives. The sort of life that those in Taiwan now live. But this has not been the experience of those across the Straits. In fact, the PRC saw such goals as a direct threat. Michael Beckley observed in this month's Foreign Affairs that despite President George H.W. Bush moving quickly to thaw relations with China following the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989, then considered the US was, and I quote, waging a world war without gun smoke. After President Clinton granted China most favoured nation status, Jiang Zemin reportedly warned his foreign policy officials that this, quote, so-called engagement policy was just another way to, as he said, try with ulterior motives to change the country's socialist system, to westernise and divide our country and put pressure on us in an attempt to overwhelm us and put us down. Xi sees the assertive bipartisan stance of the Trump and Biden administrations towards China in the same terms. The PRC has never fallen for the West engagement as being anything other than an attempt to see change, but Beijing is not for changing. This must surely be clear to us by now. This requires dealing with the situation in the Indo-Pacific as it is, not as we would prefer it to be. There are deeply irreconcilable issues between the PRC and Western democracies, including Australia. This must now be taken as a given and cause us to adjust our approach accordingly and define a clearer pathway for engagement with Beijing that more clearly recognises the guardrails and the boundaries. These events must lead like-minded nations, whether it is those who are particularly motivated to protect liberty and democracy like Australia and Japan and the United States, or many in ASEAN who simply want a more stable region where their own sovereignty is protected to take greater precautions to protect against PRC's assertions in the Indo-Pacific, for which Ty Taiwan serves as the canary in the mine. Such a deterrent should not be confined to the military, military sphere, but also build economic, economic and diplomatic resilience to coercion through offensive and defensive measures. Strengthening Taiwan's resilience diplomatically, economically, militarily is becoming increasingly urgent this includes not only to ward off an invasion, but to survive and endure a blockade. Such urgency must also be demonstrated by Taiwan itself. Israel is an even smaller nation than Taiwan and likewise lives under constant threat as we are observing at this very moment with the outrageous terrorist attacks occurring in that country. But they spend considerably more proportionally on its defence than here in Taiwan. Measures must be put in place to enhance the resilience of both Taiwan and the region to increasing coercion and intimidation and deny the calculus of aggression and worse invasion. We must continue our resolve to preserve the status quo in Taiwan. This is important both to prevent conflict and safeguard the freedom of the people of Taiwan, but also to keep alive and on display the better model of a free society here in Taiwan. So I started by saying I conclude the same way. Much has changed in the past 50 years. For those Chinese fortunate enough to have spent those years here in Taiwan, and especially more recently, they now experience a freedom and prosperity previously unknown to them and their forebears, and which you are right to celebrate and value. For those Chinese who have lived under communism and authoritarianism during this time, where political, religious and economic freedoms are absent, their experience has been less fortunate. I hope and pray that one day they will know the liberty that we, who have the good grace to be able to share it, must never take it for granted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister Morrison, for your insight and strong support for Taiwan. Please return to your seat. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, now we'd like to invite Minister Wu to propose a toast. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, I have a couple of uh, very brief things to say at this point. Uh, you mentioned about economic sanction or economic coercion. Uh, Australia 
was under a coercion. Uh, and since day one of the Chinese announced the ban of Australian red wine, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Taiwan have been serving Australian red wine. We never stopped, including tonight. And I think this is a very important gesture of our solidarity with Australia. And I'm sure there are many other democracies they are also testing the freedom of wine. It's a solidarity with Australia. And if we can all stand together in solidarity, I think we can overcome the Chinese economic coercion. Now, I would like to propose a toast to our dear keynote speaker and also the participants tonight. Cheers. Cheers. So tonight we are serving the Freedom Wine and hope that all of the democracies can stand together and let's embrace freedom and democracy. And I have a second point to make very briefly. Uh, one thing that Ambassador Kraft uh, has left in the hearts of the Taiwanese people is that everywhere she goes, she always carries an old bear with her. And that has become a very famous story here in Taiwan. And that's a sign of your support for Taiwan. And that is highly treasured and appreciated. And tonight, I also carry the same uh, old bear uh, with me. And I would like to present it to uh, Mr. Morrison. And I hope you will see that old bear represents Taiwan. Thank you very much, Mr. Wu, and thank you, Mr. Morrison. So when you travel next time, remember also to bring the Obeer with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now the banquet will begin. Bon appetit. Thank you very much. 那现场的媒体朋友们也谢谢大家的莅临，我们有请媒体朋友可以跟随工作人员到场外，主办单位备有餐盒，再次感谢大家的参与。So we would like to um, and hope that everybody will enjoy the banquet tonight. Thank you very much.